Hi, my name is Alex Caseno and I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society. Today we'll be having Lynn Whitelaw and he'll be speaking about the history and art of Tarpon Springs. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, to start, um, I want to say that I consider myself a Tarponite. I was not born in Tarpon Springs. I don't currently live in Tarpon Springs but I've spent a lot of, of my life in Tarpon Springs, and I still spend a lot of time there today. Uh, but Tarpon sort of gets into your soul. Uh, for 23 years, since becoming the founding director of the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art, uh, I've been immersed in Tarpon Springs and have had an opportunity to not only observe uh, and study the history of its culture, uh, but also I have been a contributor through my work uh, at the museum and in 2012, I was asked to contribute an article for the Arts and Reflection on 125 years uh, regarding George Ennis and George Ennis Jr. I've also been quite involved in uh, getting George Ennis Jr. nominated uh, to the Florida Artist Hall of Fame. Um, what I'm going to present today is uh, basically something I've been working on for about the past year and a half, um, and it's to uh, give an overview of, of the history of the arts in Tarpon Springs. To begin with, for uh, such a small town, Tarpon Springs has a very rich history in the arts, uh, in architecture, the visual arts, music, film, folk life, and even in the culinary arts, uh, Tarpon Springs is exemplar. For example, um, there are 10 inductees into Florida's Folk Heritage Hall of Fame who are from Tarpon Springs. That's more than any other city in Florida. While most of them are Greek, uh, William uh, Emerson, called Billy the Kid, is an African-American rockabilly noted uh, musician and preacher who's still alive, and he was inducted uh, back in um, uh, 2017. Uh, some of the others here, uh, John Lullius down here established the Lavinia Dance Troupe, uh, still very active in uh, Tarpon, uh, and uh, Nick Toff, who's the last of the Sponge Diver uh, Helmet Makers, and uh, Tina Bukafalos, uh, who used to be the Cultural Resources Officer for uh, Tarpon and has done a lot to bring awareness of the Greek uh, community to Tarpon. The Florida Artist Hall of Fame uh, has, uh, is a prestigious award in the state capitol building, and it includes three inductees from Tarpon Springs, only surpassed by Miami and Tallahassee for the number of its inductees. Our favorite Sun artist, Christopher Still, was inducted in 2000, and in 2019, George Ennis Jr. and uh, musician Bertie Higgins were inducted. If we go back to the First Nations, the First Peoples of Tarpon Springs, uh, dates to prehistoric times when indigenous peoples, the Tokabaga Indians, lived in the area. Uh, in 1896, uh, Frank Hamilton Cushing from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington came to Tarpon Springs and excavated the Safford Mine, uh, a mound near downtown. downtown uh, to find pottery and other artifacts, which are today mostly in the collection of the University of Pennsylvania. They document that Tarpon Springs was a site for exchange with other native groups in the area, including the Wheaton Island and Safety Harbor cultures. Mounds are still around, such as the Anclote Mound, down here below, uh, which is on the north side of the Anclote River. Uh, moving to the historic uh, era, Tarpon Springs was a scattered group of home sites, modest vernacular homes like the Boyer Cottage here from seven, uh, 1878 that were built along the coastal Antelope River or the adjacent bayous. Uh, this home can be seen at Heritage Village, which is down in uh, unincorporated Largo, operated by the county in what is called Heritage Village, uh, the uh, Pinewood Cultural Center. The town of Tarpon Springs dates from its founding in 1887 with just uh, 300 residents. 
making it uh, the oldest municipality in Pinellas County. That same year, a lighthouse was built uh, on Ancloak Key to mark the waterway entrance to the city. That structure in cast iron, coated cast iron, was considered a modern marvel at the time. And the Orange Belt Railroad uh, arrived that year uh, and was to be a total game changer for the emerging city. Uh, looking at the maps here, uh, you can see that Tarpon Springs is surrounded by water. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico, the Anclo River, which is a very meandering river, coming back into all these little bayous. We're going to look at Spring Bayou, which is where the town was established. But then also you had fresh water with the large, uh, it was called Lake Butler, uh, today called Lake Tarpon. And so all of this made uh, Tarpon Springs uh, uh, just a natural area uh, for sportsmen uh, to come here. Uh, when they originally established Tarpon Springs, it was done along Spring Bayou here, was considered to be the center, and that's where the city dock was put. Uh, when uh, the town was first uh, established, the founding fathers used the adage, famous Tarpon Springs, to describe a place no one had ever really heard of uh, um, or been to before in order to attract developers. Even the name Tarpon Springs is a misnomer uh, because uh, it was uh, in Spring Bayou uh, they saw a manatee in the winter and mistook them to be tarpon. And so, but the name Tarpon Springs uh, was used. Um, the town's early history is associated with the notoriety of uh, Governor Safford, who sold millions of acres of land from his porch, which will become Pinellas, Hillsborough, and Pasco counties. Uh, within a few years, northern uh, wealthy northerners were investing in Tarpon Springs. Um, and here's a vintage photograph of uh, Spring Bayou and the uh, Mary Sanford um, um, steamboat that would come to the city dock. Um, you will also have, this is the Safford house, and from the porch there uh, all the land was being sold. Uh, and then as you go out to Sacadia Cemetery, uh, there was the Safford Memorial. What cemeteries were in those early days were a park. You went out to celebrate the Civil War uh, veterans who uh, were buried there to the early founders of the city, uh, and you often had picnics. So this was the Safford Memorial for picnics out at Sacadia. That is also located at the Pinewood Cultural Center. And one of the earliest pieces of sculpture, we might say, for Tarpon Springs, which is the funeral monument for uh, Safford. Around Spring Bayou, <clears throat> it was uh, referred to by the um, developers who came there as um, the Golden Crescent. I did fail to mention that the other term that the Chamber of Commerce used was uh, Venice of the South because of all of the bayous and waterways uh, that could be developed. So Spring Bayou became the center of that and that's where uh, the Golden Crescent, as it was referred to, as wealthy northerners began to build boat houses around the bayou and very incredible houses. When you think of how these houses were built um, in, in a time when uh, wood was still being brought in by steamer and uh, uh, there wasn't access to a Home Depot. Uh, uh, and the uh, Knapp House is one of the oldest houses, uh, designed in the Queen Anne style, and at the top of it, it has a circular golden crescent, and that's where the name came from, even the shape of the house is in the shape of a crescent. Uh, an incredible home to be built at this particular time. Uh, the Fleming House, uh, just around the bayou uh, from the 1890s in more of a Victorian style, actually originally had some Japanese influences. And then the Clemson House in 1902 is really a marvel of the Newport Shingle style, a very large house that's going through some restoration right now uh, and is uh, uh, just remarkable. All of these houses were built with exotic Florida woods, 
many of which do not exist anymore, and they also imported woods in uh, to build these, uh, these houses. In 1990, 145 historic buildings reflecting a variety of residential architectural styles was designated the Tarpon Springs Natural Historic District. Um, and you can see where these uh, houses um, done in not just these unique styles, but also um, four, uh, the four corner style houses, uh, four square houses, and also bungalows that continued. And on streets uh, named, uh, called the fruit um, salad, uh, streets, uh, orange, lime, lemon, pineapple, uh, things like that. So it was kind of a, uh, this was all to appeal to developers to come here, build their winter homes. Tarpon was pretty dead in the summer uh, during these uh, years. And actually the natives uh, who lived in Tarpon year round, uh, most of them worked for these uh, wealthy northerners maintaining their homes in the uh, months that they were not there. One of the, uh, as I said, famous and wealthy individuals of America's Gilded Age came to Tarpon Springs in the late 19th century. Perhaps the most famous was artist George Ennis, uh, who was at the height of his fame uh, and considered America's greatest uh, painter at that time. So him coming to Tarpon Springs was quite remarkable. He had come earlier in the 1880s uh, with a group of wealthy northerners from, uh, of investors from uh, Thomasville, Georgia. He remembered it once the railroad came, then he returned. He had injured his hand, the hand that he painted with, so it would be this hand, and um, he came to Florida to recuperate in the winter months. Um, he came here for four winters between 1890 and 1894 and produced some of his best late uh, paintings here. He put the title Tarpon Springs in 16 of the 22 paintings uh, that he did. So uh, early morning Tarpon Springs, for example, uh, they would serve as great advertising for this young new little town. Um, and um, these paintings were shown in New York, in Boston, all over New England, and also in Paris and in Europe. So the name Tarpon Springs was put out there as this new place to, to come. It can even be argued that um, modern art began in Tarpon Springs because, and I'll explain that just for a minute, because, because he had broken his hand, he couldn't paint, so he would put the paint on the side of his, uh, of his hand and he would do what we call scrum the painting. So that's a very modern concept. Uh, and it will influence everybody from uh, John Marin up through Jackson Pollock mm -hmm. as a sort of process-oriented uh, artwork. This is a piece that's in the Leeper Ratner Museum of Arts collection. Uh, this is one of his most famous pieces uh, called Home of the Heron, or The Sun's Last Reflection, that's in the Chicago Art Institute. Uh, they are really amazing, amazing paintings. Uh, and because it says Tarpon Springs, it was very important for the city. Uh, Ennis came by train, and a Tarpon Springs was now an accessible winter resort. This was a real game changer when the train came. Prior to that, if Ennis wanted to come from New York City to Tarpon Springs, it would take probably about two weeks. And that would be on, you know, going by cart and wagon and over rough roads, and then you take trains, and then you might take some other kind of uh, transportation. Um, and then you eventually got to Cedar Key and you had to take the steamer, and I mean, it was a long, long process. When the railroad came to Tarpon Springs, you could make it from New York City to Tarpon Springs in 36 hours. That was like the equivalent of jet travel mm -hmm. that we would have experienced after World War II, commercial jet travel. So it was just a game changer. And it made Tarpon Springs very accessible as a resort, uh, a winter resort. Um, <clears throat> the original train station that was built burned to the ground. And in uh, 1909, this one that still stands today 
was uh, built. And that's a pretty elaborate station for a town that had less than a thousand people. Uh, it was pretty incredible. Um, but some of the early uh, hotels, uh, we'll talk about Mother Mears a little bit more later, but she built the first hotel, sort of a guest house called The Ferns, um, and um, that operated uh, uh, all the way through her life. Um, in 1913, uh, the Tarpon Inn was built, uh, and it was so successful that houses adjacent to it were turned into guest houses. And so the um, Tarpon Inn Guest House, built in 1910, uh, is still a bed and breakfast today. It's always been uh, sort of a, a guest house. Um, and then uh, the Villa Pomosa uh, was actually a boat, boat house, um, but after the demise of the Tarpon Inn, um, it uh, became a very popular uh, uh, resort accommodation for winter residents until uh, that was torn down. Um, I wanted to say a few things about the, um, the Tarpon Inn. Uh, built in 1913 with state-of-the-art facility, 105 rooms and a four-floor building across from Spring Bayou at the city dock. It was listed as one of the finest resort hotels on the west coast of Florida but it would serve as the social heart of uh, Tarpon Springs for many, many years. Um, okay. Although the sponge industry began in this area as early as the 1890s, much of the economic and cultural growth of Tarpon Springs begins in 1905 <clears throat> with the immigration of about 500 Greeks to work in the sponge trade industry. It was moving up from Key West, um, and the influence um, that the Greeks would provide was great recognition for the city, both statewide and nationally. And uh, it introduced uh, Greek culture, language, religion, food, shipbuilding techniques, music, and other mores that will greatly enhance the cultural diversity of our state, as well uh, of our town, as well as our state. For Tarpon Springs, it was now being recognized for two things, as a working port with the sponge industry and, and fishing, and a resort destination. So it's two communities that will complement the growth of the city um, uh, as we go forward. Okay. Um, as a city, and, and I really don't want to call it a city, it's really a town at this point, uh, began to grow in 1915. A city hall was uh, built, uh, which is now the cultural center, a cultural center for Tarpon Springs, designed by architect Ernest Ivy Cook in the classical revival style. This reflected the desire of the small town uh, to have buildings that would represent styles familiar to the transplants moving to the community. It was also done in brick because of the concerns over fires that had plagued so many cities, but also Tarpon Springs. A brick style for public buildings will continue into the 1920s, can be seen in the current uh, city hall, uh, which was, uh, is now, uh, was built in 1925 as Tarpon Springs High School. Uh, by Emmett Hall in the Beaux-Arts style. Uh, it is now our City Hall and Performing Arts Center. Um, from the beginning, Tarpon Springs uh, was unique in the word medicinal springs that were in the bayou. The city, because of the emergence of the uh, uh, orange, in, orange uh, industry, uh, there were the therapeutic smells of pine forests and orange groves that surrounded the city. It was surrounded by waterways, including the Anclote River, uh, Lake Tarpon, and to the south, Wall Springs, which was also for uh, therapeutic uh, use. So it attracted health-conscious tourists. It also will begin to attract sportsmen into the area. Um, and um, it will become a, uh, a destination and, of course, another uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, 
adage, a sportsman's paradise, because of the Gulf of Mexico and Anclote River and all of these things. Uh, but also, uh, there was the originally uh, the idea of building a golf course, the one that's there now I think is from 1909, uh, uh, but the idea of attracting people through building of docks and building of things like uh, the earliest golf courses, this was to make it a, a paradise for sportsmen. The real game changer then, next for Tarpon Springs, was the development of the Dixie Highway in 1925. Uh, and that came with, that was a national roadway, and it had a lot of advertising that came with it. And so Tarpon Springs became very uh, popular uh, with what we call the tin can tourists. Is Dixie Highway Alt-19 or 19? Today? It's Alt-19. Oh. Yeah, there was no 19 ah. at that point. Yeah, And I love this. Uh, where the Iceman uh, cuts no ice or the gas or the coal or rent man either. So you carried, uh, tin can tourists carried everything in tin cans. Their gasoline, their food, their everything. And uh, uh, Tarpon Springs will set up uh, camps for them, as most cities did. Uh, they were became very important contributors to the culture and during that time. As we see coming out from the uh, city docks and going along Tarpon Avenue, downtown uh, Tarpon will emerge as a commercial center. Um, originally, all the buildings were built in wood, but after a very destructive fire in 1894, brick now becomes the primary building material. Vintage photograph of Tarpon Springs uh, shows us, where is that, right here, uh, shows us three major buildings here, here, and here. Uh, the oldest is the Fernald building. That was the first building and major building built after uh, the fire in 1894. Uh, that's the building located right here and was designed by a New, York, um, New Orleans architect. Um, the building right here is that of the Taylor, Taylor Arcade. Uh, and the Taylor Arcade was a really modern building at the time because it built, it went across the block. So it would capture the breezes coming through with transom windows. It became sort of the uh, commercial center for Tarpon Springs, of course, sort of like malls became in the uh, 70s. But, Is that um, where Danny's Restaurant was in there? What's that? Is that where that little Danny's Restaurant Yes, was? yes, yeah. And that's down here. But that was a movie theater that was built in 1938. It was an 800-seat movie theater with a town that only had a couple thousand people. An 800-seat movie theater was quite remarkable. Now it is a restaurant. Yeah. And then the last building is uh, the uh, Mears building. The Mears family is very important to Tarpon Springs. And in 1914, they built a, a commercial building for the headquarters of all of their um, influences and businesses. It also included a hotel and the first major uh, movie theater that had air conditioning and uh, that was uh, there in the back. It was designed by M. Leo Elliott, who is an architect from uh, Tampa. You know, if you see Tampa City Hall, that's an M. Leo Elliott building. Uh, he's really an important architect. Uh, it was done in his signature uh, yellow brick, and unfortunately last year this building was all painted black, yeah. which I think was uh, kind of a, somebody should have been more at the wheel uh, before allowing that to happen. Um, during this period of growth for the town of Tarpon, uh, the arts were also expanding. In 1902, the son of George Ennis, George Ennis Jr., decided to establish a winter home and studio in Tarpon Springs. His son had died in the summer of a, uh, uh, he drowned in an uh, uh, accident, and they just felt like they needed to get away. The, um, they will move to Tarpon Springs, and they bought the small house that um, George Ennis had rented on uh, Orange Street, uh, and he will now um, rename it Innes Manor, 
and it will be turned um, over the years into a 28-room uh, home with uh, cottages uh, in the back as an artist colony, his large studio, and this will become the center of cultural life in Tarpon Springs up until the 1940s. Um, George Ennis Jr. Uh, was a wonderful painter. He's a great artist. However, his name is George Ennis Jr. He is the son of the most famous landscape artist in America at the time. That is a kiss of death. Uh, he was born in Paris. He went uh, back to Paris after his father's death. He destroyed all of his paintings that, his, that were in his father's style. He goes to Paris, he establishes himself as an artist there, comes back, um, and he, in the, those years, he inherited the wealth of his father, which was massive. I mean, when his father died, his paintings sold for huge sums of money. So he became very wealthy through that. And then he happened to just marry one of the wealthiest women in America. So here you are, an artist. He never has to work a day in his life. Uh, but nobody's going to take you serious as an artist uh, if you are uh, the late Gilded Age elite and uh, you're George Ennis Jr. So uh, it was, Tarpon Springs is very important for his legacy because of these things that he had. But he served on the um, board of the Century Publishing Company. He was an author. He was, I mean, he's a really amazing uh, person. So uh, it's uh, kind of unfortunate. His wife was Julia Goodrich Smith. Her father owned the Century Publishing Company. Um, George Ennis was a little taller than I am, kind of a mousy guy, very much an introvert, um, but also a very fine um, uh, in conversation. He loved to have dialogue with people, but he was a pretty quiet person. His wife, Julia, was six foot tall, a very big commanding woman from New York and New Jersey. They lived in, they had homes in New York City and Montclair, New Jersey, and Cragsmoor, uh, and Tarpon Springs, and they had a house in Paris, uh, an apartment in Paris. Uh, they lived a, a very Gilded Age life. Uh, Julia was quite a philanthropist in her own right, with her own money. She um, uh, was the founder of the Tarpon Springs Library, and in their home, uh, she had invited people to come in, kids especially, to come into their home. They had this huge living room with big tables on it. All the publications by the Century Publishing Company were on the tables. She said, you come in and please take a book. Uh, but you couldn't take a book unless you told her about the book you had just read. And of course, next door, she established the first library in Tarpon Springs. Um, she would organize soirees where, um, when in the winter months, when every, they invited everybody to come on their dime uh, to stay in Tarpon Springs, and um, they would, uh, um, she'd put on these grand parties um, where you had to dress as your favorite book, uh, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, here's the Tarpon Library as it is today. And then if you go out from Tarpon and you go up the Ancloat River, after it kind of does all its meandering, it narrows and it gets into a very uh, beautiful, very dense, almost a jungle-like area. And uh, in fact, for many years, jungle tours were conducted from Tarpon Springs up into Pasco County, where the uh, river narrowed. George Ennis and Julia bought property up there and built a home right near here. If you go over Perrine Ranch Road in Tarpon Springs, and you look to the left, if you're going west, east, uh, this is the same site you see right now. Uh, and this property right here was the property they bought called Camp Comfort. He built a studio there, he did a lot of his work uh, that we'll see there, uh, and they would do these, uh, he had his private yacht brought down to Tarpon, and when the guests came in the winter months, they would all gather on the boat, they would go up to Camp Comfort, have a big uh, soiree, uh, and all on the Ennis dime. 
In 1918, a uh, disastrous storm, a nor'easter, not a hurricane, a nor'easter, hit Tarpon Springs. And it blew out all the windows of their church, which was the uh, Universalist church at that time. And it blew out all the windows. Because it was right at the time of the end of World War I, it was difficult to get materials like glass. It was difficult to get uh, uh, service people uh, to do uh, repairs. And so uh, George Ennis uh, provided the money for them to just wall up the windows. And he said, I will paint some uh, a triptych for uh, the church where the windows were blown out. There were uh, six sets of windows that were blown out. So the first, he built a, um, a triptych. This is all done at Camp Comfort at his property up in uh, Pasco. Uh, and it, if you go up there, you can see how the river looks very much like that today. And then he does a second set called uh, uh, the 23rd Psalm, and beside still water, he leadeth me in green pastures. So he will do these during, uh, between 1920 and 1926, he will do eight paintings for the church. At his death, um, because this now has become a repository of uh, Ennis's work, his wife Julia had uh, paintings that hung in the Louvre of Ennis shipped to Tarpon from Paris, from France, and then over the years other paintings have been added uh, to their collection. The church has been closed, was closed for six years, going through a major restoration and sinkholes. It opened up, then the pandemic came. Well, it opened up, paintings went up, found termites, paintings go down, pandemic happened, so you still can't see the paintings. But Hopefully, very soon, you'll be able to return uh, to this. One of the things that they did in remodeling it was opened up the windows, so some of the windows, so that's great. So this becomes very important for the legacy of George Ennis are these paintings. Um, in 1924, he does a painting called The Only Hope. The Only Hope was one of the most celebrated paintings of the uh, 1920s. Um, the painting was originally shown in Tarpon, and then the Tarpon Chamber of Commerce organized a national tour of it that went from uh, Tarpon to Lakeland to Savannah to Charleston to Philadelphia, eventually Washington, D.C., where Calvin Coolidge saw it, and Calvin Coolidge says, I want this painting to hang in the rotunda of the, of the Capitol building. And George Ennis said, no, I painted it for my little church in Tarpon Springs, and that's where I want it to stay. So after it gets to New York City, it gets, there's a long history, I won't go into it all, but it got kind of decried, uh, like uh, a lot of the fadism of the 1920s, and then the painting, they ended the tour, it came back to Tarpon Springs. It is intended as a response uh, to World War I, uh, and it's talking, it's showing the destruction of cities. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating painting to, to, to look at. In 1926, um, Ennis did a, another, uh, uh, worked on his last painting. He dies at 72, uh, up at his home in Craigsmore in New York, overlooking the Hudson River. Uh, and he does this painting called The Lord is in His Holy Temple, which is sort of a transcendentalist uh, view of, uh, of um, nature. Um, I could go on about Ennis, I need to stop. Uh, the visual arts in, in Tarpon in the 1920s, um, uh, Hayes Bigelow was a photographer, but also a, a, a wealthy um, investor um, who came to Tarpon Spring. He had money, so he invested in all of this photography equipment uh, to do circuit photographs, and his circuit photographs were widely circulated up north, again, adding to the reputation of Tarpon Springs as a, a very unique uh, community. Here's Spring Bayou, we can see the Tarpon Inn and some of the great boat houses that were around um, uh, there. Um, during the 1920s, Ennis invited everybody to come to Tarpon Springs, all the artists, 
that he knew up at his artist colony in Craigsmoor. They came down on his dime. Uh, so Winfred Scott Klein and uh, Charles Curran uh, were two of the major artists, but there were numbers of artists. And they would stay in the little cottages that were on Ennis's property, come and stay for two months, whatever. Um, George Ennis um, will also, in 1925, do a very large painting that is at the Universalist Church called Spring Bayou, or Sunset on the Bayou, uh, and is of Spring Bayou. You can almost match these two together because there's the tarp and hen in the background there. Uh, this um, painting was done out on Creamer Bayou, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, and was for the 100th anniversary of George Ennis's birth. And it was also for the dedication of the Ennis Memorial Art Center, which was to be built on this property. Uh, there, was, there was actually $100,000 raised to build it. Uh, it was going to be where art patrons from around the world will be able to come to Tarpon Springs and see the great paintings of George Ennis and, of course, George Ennis Jr. in the church. Uh, it's a really beautiful painting that he did. The performing arts were equally strong in Tarpon in the 1920s. Uh, Bulmhera Krill was a very well-known um, and he even says so, world famous <laughs> cornetist and his band from Chicago was invited to come to Tarpon Springs back in like 1917 uh, and then came um, and uh, through much of the um, uh, 20s was paid as much as $40,000 a year by the city of Tarpon Springs to put on two daily concerts in Mears Park uh, for all the tourists who were coming to Tarpon. There, there was a real emphasis of acknowledging the arts in Tarpon Springs in the 1920s. Um, Mother Mears died in uh, 1926 and a urn was uh, placed there uh, in the park where these concerts took place, where there was a band uh, stand. Uh, and um, probably uh, Julia uh, Ennis uh, probably paid for this urn. It's still there today on Tarpon Avenue. In 1924, the city decided to invest in doing a big water sports carnival and illuminated uh, fleet parade. It was quite remarkable. They built a, a fountain, I think it goes 70 feet into the air, uh, that came out of Spring Bayou. It would be lit at night in all these different colors. There was a big tarpon barge that was uh, uh, floated around the bayou. There were two 80-foot long gondolas that came from a, a centennial exhibit in Philadelphia that were brought down and you could take gondola rides around the bayou. Uh, they surrounded the entire bayou with la Japanese lanterns um, and then they put uh, two barges out in the middle of the, of the uh, um, Spring Bayou, and they would do performances, operas, uh, uh, every year. And the MS Pinafore, what is the other one? Um, yeah, I just skipped a lot of pages here. The MS Pinafore in 24, the Mikado in 25, and then in 1926, they invited the Metropolitan Opera Company to come to Tarpon Springs and do a Midsummer Night's Dream. So these were like remarkable events that were going on for little old Tarpon Springs to celebrate uh, the arts. It was quite ambitious and Tarpon Springs was hot, especially for the arts. Um, and the publicity of The Only Hope, which had national recognition, the Ennis Memorial Art Center, which was in every publication, and the Water Sports Carnival appeared in newspapers all over the country. The architecture of the 1920s along uh, Dixie Highway, Pinellas Avenue, alternate 19, uh, the opening of the Shaw Arcade, an arcade motor hotel in 1925. It was a remarkable block-long building uh, that uh, was a multi-use, had, like I said, hotel, offices, restaurants, uh, shops, 
Uh, it was kind of a coming of age, and it was in what we call the Mediterranean Revival style, which is a style that's associated with the, the Florida land boom. Um, and uh, it's now called the Tarpon Arcade, but it was originally called the Shaw Arcade. Um, the um, Tarpon was kind of limited because of its water, and so the Beckett Bridge was built. It's right there by the Tarpon Yacht Club today, and goes over, and that now opened up a whole new area of Tarpon Springs for development. First out was Innes Park, uh, which was being developed with Mediterranean Revival uh, homes, like you see here, and uh, this house was actually the home of uh, Bomir Krill. He didn't build it, but he bought it. He was the first owner, and uh, lived uh, in it, and he would conduct concerts in the little park that you can still see there uh, along Creamer Bayou. Uh, other developments went out, uh, so Sunset Park, and there was a big hotel that was built out there that's no longer standing. Um, and, um, but I do want to talk about the Beckett Bridge. It is a single leaf rolling lift bascal bridge. That is this portion right here. It is still the original bridge. It is one of the last surviving ones in Florida on the National Register. The con it was originally built as a wooden bridge, but now it's twice been rebuilt with concrete uh, up to this um, uh, single leaf lift. Um, so it's quite, uh, quite remarkable. Um, do I want to talk about that? Um, Uh, Tarpon Spring also still be, uh, became a tourist destination. In addition to the working port, uh, you know, it was known as a, a health resort in the 1920s, a playground for the wealthy, an artist colony. But the Greek community centered around the Sponge Dogs and its investment in uh, restaurants, shops, uh, and development of the docks uh, also made it a tourist attraction. Um, and the Greek sponge drivers became, and their families became more established. They developed homes, shops, restaurants, and this area became known as Greek Town. And originally the buildings were built of wood, a problem, they catch fire. So things like the original Louis Pappas uh, Riverside Curio Shop uh, was vulnerable to fire. As the Greek Town gets more money and wealth, they begin to build in brick, and the uh, building here um, is really a, a Granatus building, is a beautiful building of uh, brick uh, craftsmanship. Um, and so I think when you go down to the docks, you're not always aware of the, some of the brick buildings, but they really are quite remarkable. Um, eventually, uh, brick, and then today, trying to correspond more to uh, the Greek um, heritage, stucco seems to be the main uh, building material that has been used. Um, there are cultural contributions, culinary food, of course, shipbuilding, and I think there are five, uh, four or five uh, um, sponge that are on the National Register uh, of uh, significant uh, structures. Um, sponge diving, music, dance, um, Epiphany, of course, becomes a major part since 1903 of uh, the Greek heritage. In 2014, Greek Town Historic District was established, and um, it is on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, did I have how many buildings? I'm not sure how many on it, but it's quite a big uh, area. What is important, uh, it's 140 acres, it makes up the Greek Town National Historic District. Uh, what is, makes it more unique is that it was designated a traditional cultural property. It is the first one designated in Florida. There are only a few in the United States. It has to do with the cultural contributions of uh, immigrant peoples to uh, American culture. Um, but what is so important for the future is that this is being put onto the National Park Service. So at some point in the, in the future, there may be designated a national park, uh, parts of, of Greektown. 
The unbridled optimism of Florida in the 1920s, though, was short-lived. In that time, it was tremendous wealth and money and building and all kinds of things and, and visionaries uh, here. But the Florida real estate boom busted in 1926, and it brought an end to... The city was uh, already talking about building a major civic center for concerts. Well, that was killed. The Ennis Memorial Art Center killed, um, and the suburban residential neighborhoods, Ennis Park and Sunset Park, those all died too. In March 1927, and it's, it's sort of fascinating, they did the dedication for the Ennis' last painting at the church. They walked down the street, had this wonderful lunch at Tarpon Inn, heart of social Tarpon, and a month later, uh, that building burned to the ground. Um, it was the social heart of Tarpon, and now it was gone. Uh, the stock market crash in 1929 ended um, the Roaring Twenties. The Great Depression ushered in uh, a major period of economic decline for Tarpon Springs. Tourism just died. The sponge industry was the only thing that kept the city solvent. Uh, and in uh, 1939, there was a blight of the sponges and a red tide in 1947 that will have long-term effects on the sponge industry. Of course, the development of synthetic sponges was a final keel to it, although this is still the largest sponge producing area in the world. Uh, the loss of six, 17 uh, young men, uh, many of them Greek, uh, during World War II was another shadow on the city. And that was a pretty high percentage for uh, uh, a town the size of uh, Tarpon Springs. And many of the Greeks were actually it, that's another fascinating side story, but uh, because they were wanted for uh, the Navy uh, to work in uh, diving. One of the things that did uh, was a positive for Tarpon Springs uh, from the 1920s to the 1940s um, was motion pictures. Uh, some of you will know that Newport Ritchie was an early center on the east coast of the United States for silent films. But by the 1930s, there was a strong interest brought about in literature and film based on sort of a romanticism of the sponging industry. Short stories by writer Eustace Adam referenced Tarpon Springs and were widely popular in the 1920s. Then an Ernest Hemingway, how many of you saw the Ernest Hemingway series on PBS? Nobody's just saw? Oh my God, if you can watch that, it is incredible. Um, but living in Key West, he writes To Have or To Have Not in 1937 about sponge, uh, sponging in Key West and Cuba, and it created an international interest in stories about sponge divers. As early as the 1920s, a silent film called Bitter Fruit was actually filmed at George Ennis' studio at Camp Comfort. But in the 1930s, with the development of talkies, several major uh, films and documentaries were now filmed in Tarpon Springs. The Diver in 1932, 16 Fathoms Deep in 1934, uh, with Lon Chaney. It was the first real commercial success that uh, um, highlighted Tarpon Springs. There was an international film called Obaya that was done in 1935, and parts of it were filmed at Anne Clote Lighthouse. 20 Fathoms Deep in 1939, based on a Eustace Adams short story, but was not a very successful uh, film. But also in 1939, a major documentary called The Story of the Sponge was filmed, and it developed new ways for underwater filming and was one of the first films shot in color. And it still remains an important film in uh, film history today. In the story of the sponge, a sponger by the name of John Michael Gonadas, you can see right here, became a celebrity both locally and nationally. He, was, uh, he has had established a lifelong relationship with famous director Ilya Kazan and appeared in several of his most famous movies, 
including Streetcar Named Desire, among others. He was also featured in the remake of Sixteen Fathoms Deep with Lloyd Bridges and Lon Chaney, which premiered at the Royal Theatre in Tarpon in 1947, that movie theater that, uh, where the restaurant is today. Um, Ganadas uh, also appeared in 1953 film Beneath the Twelve Mile Reef. This is a major release. It was done in uh, the new technique of Cinemascope um, at Technicolor, starring Ro uh, uh, Robert Wagner and Terry Moore in a Romeo and Juliet storyline of rival sponge families from Tarpon Springs and Key West. It probably did more for Tarpon Springs in the 1950s than anything else, um, and it should be required re uh, viewing for anybody who lives in Tarpon Springs. And you'll recognize uh, some of the buildings at the docks in downtown that are in that uh, movie. One of the most ambitious projects going on in all of Florida uh, that wasn't a WPA project, but during World War II, was uh, the building of St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, it is now a cathedral since 1978. It was begun in 1941, and one of the things that helped to uh, bring such emphasis to it was at the Greek Pavilion of the 1939 World's Fair in New York, I uh, had, I think it was 40 tons of pentelic marble, and they couldn't ship it back to, uh, to uh, Greece because of the war, so they sent it to Tarpon Springs, and that was used for much of the interior uh, walls of uh, St. Nicholas. The, this church was going on during the war was just so remarkable. It is a beautiful example of neo-Byzantine architecture. It was designed by the Eugene Brothers of Chicago, and it is based, uh, uh, at least the back portion, it's a, it's a Latin cross plan, but the back portion is like a central dome church, uh, like Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, uh, Turkey. Um, the, I'm sorry, it was 15 tons of pentelic marble. Later, later they added 60 tons of Carrara marble in 1965. Um, there were 23 hand-painted stained glass windows by Joseph Lawrence that were installed when the church was being built. Three large Czechoslovakian crystal chandeliers were also installed and others later. 41 images of saints and apostles by noted icon artist George Sakalaridis that were completed in 1952. Um, and the church uh, is a masterpiece architecturally and in terms of decorative arts and is the central starting point for the annual Epiphany Festival on January 6th. It's really a beautiful church, well worth going up and taking a tour of. So recovery. After World War II, Tarpon Springs and throughout the rest of the 1940s, is still struggling to overcome its economic decline. But as time passed, post-war optimism, the expansion of the highways, the growth of the automobile for leisure travel, particularly amongst the middle class, allowed Tarpon to rebuild its economy of tourism and to play off its natural coastal beauty. Sunset Beach Causeway was built in 1926, and then in 1966, Howard Park, uh, the causeway and beach were opened as a county park. Um, fishing for on uh, Lake Tarpon was also extremely popular. So you had freshwater and saltwater uh, fishing. So that was a very big thing for Tarpon uh, Springs. The attraction of the sponge docks, Greek culture, natural resources, and of course the uh, the docks expanded its shops and restaurants. The legacy of George Ennis Jr. and the paintings in the Church of the Good Shepherd were even greater assets and literally would attract tens of thousands of visitors. I am so grateful that I have this picture because it is the last of the signs that existed in the 1950s that said, Beaches, Greek painting, or Ennis Paintings, Greek Village. These were all over Tarpon Springs. 
this one was just taken down two weeks ago oh. when the city put up some new signage. I'm just grateful that I got a picture of it before mm -hmm. it, its yeah. demise. But I remember back in the 70s, these were still all over. And it's hard to imagine, but literally as many as 30,000 people a year came to see the Innes paintings mm -hmm. in the 50s in uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church and to go to the dock. So Tarpon, that will be its uh, tourism is what brings it back. The arts from the 1940s to the 1970s, um, um, and particularly because of the Ennis legacy, it began to attract nationally known artists after World War II <coughs> who would come here for the wet, uh, winter season. There was also another game changer. We keep talking about game changers. That game changer was residential and commercial air conditioning. Mm -hmm. So that meant you could now kind of come here and be a year-round resident um, and, and enjoy the area rather than just for those short winter months. Um, and so more people began moving to the area. Arthur Covey, a nationally known muralist, particularly in the WPA, uh, and his wife, Lois Linsky, a well-known children's book author and illustrator, sort of took up the void that the Innes has left. Uh, Julia, uh, where Innes died in 1926, Julia still returned until 1940. She died in 1941. So they, they were still very much a part of Tarpon's cultural scene. But uh, in the 1950s, the Coveys uh, uh, took up that. Um, and uh, they were sort of our celebrity artists. Uh, Oliver Smith, a nationally known um, stained glass artist, uh, who had done stained glass windows in New York and Washington and uh, Pittsburgh and lots of major works, um, retired to Ozona, and he will create the beautiful, colorful stained glass windows in All Saints Episcopal Church uh, that was built in Tarbes. Oliver Smith's wife was Ethel Zabriskie Banta, and in 1958, she formed the Tarpon Springs Art Association and attracted an impressive list of members uh, who lived in Upper Pinellas County, from Clearwater, from Palm Harbor, from uh, Dunedin, uh, Safety Harbor. Uh, she wanted Tarpon Springs Art Association to be a real powerful, uh, you know, and attracted some major, major artists. Um, and many of them, uh, some were uh, winter residents, many were year-round. Philip Sawyer, Dixie Cooley, um, Rachel Hartley, who was actually the niece of George Ennis, Jr. The town of Tarpon Springs began to grow, and I would say it became, went from a town to a small city. It had two newspapers, a radio station, a very established community theater, which was in Ennis Manor, because after that, uh, uh, Julia died, she sort of had it turned into a cultural center. Um, and then this also very well-respected art association, and you can see some of the work that was uh, done during that time. And if you go to the Tarpon Springs Art um, uh, Historic Society, you can see some of this work also. In the early 1970s, with the approach of the Bicentennial in 1976, the City Fathers of Tarpon Springs wanted to expand the role that heritage and the arts played in the history of the city. With a major national endowment for the uh, arts grant for cultural awareness, murals were created around the docks and in the downtown area. Unfortunately, most of those murals are now gone except for one done by Elizabeth Indianos, um, which has now been restored uh, twice. And it's really powerful as you view it across Spring Bayou, or as if you're coming up these steps, you're sort of looking to the west and into the sunset. Um, Elizabeth uh, Indianos has, remains one of the important artists in our community, and uh, she came here in the 1970s under a Florida Fine Arts Council grant as artist in residence in Tarpon Springs. Likewise, the demise of the Tarpon Springs Art Association in the mid 1960s res resulted in the reestablishment of the association in 1974. 
Uh, you can see the logo uh, here for uh, Tarpon Springs Art Association on a Greek ionic column. Um, and the part of that was the city wanted to uh, show a real presence of the arts. Um, and so uh, one of their first tasks was to um, establish a, um, uh, an outdoor art show, the Tarpon Springs Fine Arts Festival, which is held uh, annually in Craig Park. It was considered one of the top outdoor shows. It celebrated its 45th year in 2019. Unfortunately, it was canceled last year, and it is canceled this year. Hopefully, it will soon get to return. The city also developed um, a Department of Cultural Affairs, which is today called Tarpon Arts, uh, which is the Department of Cultural Services slash Division of Arts and Historical Resources, uh, and it was to, created to uh, preserve uh, the heritage, uh, culture, and historic preservation activities of the city. Since 1981, when Dr. Kathleen Monahan uh, began working with the city, and in 1986, she took over the leadership of what is today Tarpon Arts. Her knowledge, passion, ability to write grants, and to be a champion of the arts created a vital and vibrant uh, um, Tarpon Springs cultural identity. Uh, there's probably not another person who has done more for uh, making recognition of the arts uh, in Tarpon Springs than Kathleen. Um, she retired in 2017, but in 2012, a group of grateful Tarpon Springs supporters established the Dr. Kathleen Monaghan Foundation that works to underwrite funding of Tarpon Arts, uh, which is, manages the cultural center uh, in the old city hall, which is just completing reservations and will be opening up soon with a major mural by Elizabeth Indianos. Uh, the Heritage Center, um, which um, is in Craig Park. Uh, the 19, I mean the 1893 Safford House Museum, um, um, which is uh, a historic home. And the Tarpon Springs Performing Arts Center, among other activities, they also manage the Center for Gulf Coast Folk Life and the Public Arts Commission which are all today under the leadership of Diane Wood. And Kathleen is still involved in the city. She still lives there. Uh, modernist architecture as Tarpon Springs began to grow. Um, the Louis Pappas Riverside Restaurant, built in 1975, was just a major change for Tarpon Springs. It put Tarpon Springs back on the map nationally, or locally, statewide, and nationally. This restaurant, the, with the investment of the Pappas family, uh, was a 1,600-seat restaurant, 1,200-seat restaurant. They served up to 16,000 meals a day in the 1970s and 80s. It was a a destination, a culinary destination. It was uh, in magazines both nationally and internationally, putting Tarpon on the map. The building was designed by John Howie, a Tarpon uh, Tampa architect. He often considered it one of his favorite buildings. It was designed to be sort of like a Greek village along the waterfront with all these different angles. Ed Hoffman Sr. Uh, was an interior designer from St. Petersburg who moved his uh, interior design uh, firm to Tarpon Springs uh, because of what he saw as, as what was happening in the Tarpon Springs or North County area. He did the interior design. It was just too large to maintain, particularly after the Pappas family began to pass away. And I think it's unfortunate it's been kind of colored, painted in different colors, and some of its purest design has been uh, changed. St. Ignatius uh, Antioch Catholic Church by Charles Parton is really a beautiful example of contemporary um, uh, ecumenical architecture, um, the incredible interior space of it uh, with its wood ceiling and uh, stations of the cross. 
uh, and stone walls. It's a beautiful example. Uh, uh, of the 23 uh, Catholic, modern Catholic churches built, uh, I would list it uh, built since uh, the 1970s. I would say it is truly one of the, is the best. And uh, Vincent's uh, funeral home, right next door to it, Robert Brown was an architect from Miami who came up here at the insistence of, George, of Ed Hoffman Sr. Uh, and was commissioned by the Vincents to design this very minimalist uh, building. Do you reference when they started, like in 1888, Vincent Penal Home? I think they did. They're, they're the oldest <laughs> you don't have it, yeah. Yeah. Multi-generational. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I want to uh, turn to um, the, the fact that over the years, the Hoffman family, beginning with Ed Hoffman Sr., moving his architectural or his interior design firm to Tarpon Springs, and he had two sons. One son runs the interior design business today, and his other son is uh, Ed Hoffman Jr. Ed is the, currently the president of the uh, Tarpon Springs Area Historical Society, um, and is also what we call the favorite son architect of Tarpon Springs. Um, Ed uh, moved back to Tarpon Springs. He went to Tarpon High School, elementary school, all of that, uh, but moved back here in 1981 after getting a degree in architecture from the University of Florida and then uh, working in Palm Beach County for many years. Uh, he came back here, Mike Pappas asked him to come back and design the Sponge Exchange in 1983, which is sort of the center of the sponge docks today. Um, since then, uh, Ed has designed the Spinos Pappas Greek Cultural Center, uh, one of my favorite places, the Burka Creek uh, Environmental Education Center. Uh, if you've not been there, please go visit. It's out. You have to drive a mile back into the preserve uh, to even get there. Um, the Tarpon uh, Turtle Restaurant. Um, he designed both the, both the elementary schools in Tarpon Springs. Um, he also designed the uh, Jacobson Culinary Arts Academy. Many homes in Tarpon Springs and several other buildings are banned. Uh, center out at Sunset Beach, and the list goes on. Um, and Ed uh, is just retiring, but um, he's done some incredible buildings, and one that I'm extremely proud of is the Fine Arts Building Complex at St. Petersburg, Junior, uh, St. Petersburg College uh, on the Tarpon Springs campus. Uh, that building, that complex, houses a library, an arts education center, but the main uh, is the Leapart Ratner Museum of Art, um, which opened in 2020, uh, 2002. Ed Hoffman designed that building. Um, the building is listed in the one of the top 100 buildings built in the past 100 years in Florida in a, a process that was a voting process uh, that went on for the 100th anniversary of the American Institute of Architects Florida chapter. Uh, there's only two museums on it, uh, the Dali Museum and the Lepa Ratner. So this building is now nearly 20 years old. It was done uh, as a, um, this incredible spline wall that runs through it and then comes out onto what is like the prow of a ship, sort of a postmodernist nod to Tarpon Springs as an article community. I think uh, what is also important is the recognition of Alan and Isabel Lipa. Uh, Alan Lipa was um, uh, an art um, professor emeritus from Michigan State University. He inherited the collection of um, um, Abraham Ratner and through his mother, uh, Esther Gentle. Uh, it was a major collection of that family of artists, but also of other art, uh, including Henry Moore and Picasso and, and, and some others. Not major pieces, but important works and an incredible collection of prints. Um, he will give the collection to St. Petersburg College as well as about $2 million towards the building of the museum. 
This was back in the good years when there was money, <laughs> and uh, we got matching money from the state, and we were able to build this 58,000 square foot uh, building. Um, there's a lot of unique things about it, and I will always be grateful uh, to Ed Hoffman. I he feel like he's my brother. We worked together on the design of this building. Uh, it was just a highlight of my life, and uh, I know it's a great uh, piece he wants to be remembered for in his design. Another favorite son uh, artist of uh, Tarpon Springs is the visual artist uh, Christopher Still. Um, Christopher uh, was born in Dunedin, but he uh, has lived in Tarpon Springs um, almost all of his adult life. Um, and uh, I would say that his importance to the city of Tarpon Springs is through his combination of community support, his extraordinary artistic talent, his love of Florida history, and his belief in art as a force for social and cultural awareness. Um, he designed eight large murals. You can see them back here. Here's one of them. Um, for the Legislative Hall in Tallahassee and in the House of Representatives. These were done in 1999 to 2000. Um, and, um, he has done other things for the state for our 500th anniversary. He did the poster logo uh, for that. He, um, um, in Tarpon Springs, um, if you want to see many of his works as reproductions at the Heritage Center at Craig Park, those reproductions at full scale are there that you can see. But if you go over to the Tarpon Springs Library, there is a very large painting called Changing Tides that he did in 1994 that he gifted to the library there. Uh, Christopher is just a, a, a great asset to the community. And he has worked as in large a number of museum collections, uh, including the Lipa Ratner, private collections. Um, he's a, a, a highly valued artist, as I mentioned. He's on the uh, uh, list of uh, uh, the list of uh, arts in Florida, um, and these are some of the works that he has done, particularly for some of the hotels, the Sand Pearl uh, Hotel, which he's working on that piece. Um, he did uh, several pieces for the new Bellevue um, Inn, where the Bellevue Biltmore had stood. Uh, if you go into the airport, his large painting called Final Boarding, or a large sculpture that he did there in collaboration with another artist. Uh, some of his large-scale paintings, like Come What May, it's one of my favorites in a private collection. Uh, so, um, and if you go to the Vinoy Hotel, um, the Sand Pearl, um, the New Opal, uh, they're all large-scale paintings by uh, Christopher Still. In the performing arts, um, we are still emerging. Our uh, performing arts center, unfortunately, is um, under COVID rules right now, but hopefully it will return. Uh, but we have a very strong uh, performing arts uh, community. Oh, I mentioned one thing I should mention with Christopher Still. The Anclote Hospital is going through an expansion in Tarpon Springs, and he is doing a very large mural for the lobby of that uh, building. Um, the performing arts in uh, Tarpon Springs, um, um, we have a small, I think it's 300-seat auditorium. Um, the New Century Opera Company has done some incredible uh, publication or er, uh, productions. Uh, Constantine Graham, who is the son of uh, Theodore Graham and and um, 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 <laughs> um, oh God, quite long, who who's, uh, started the uh, uh, Tarpon Arts. It's their son. And he is, does uh, these. Cheryl Mims and Maria Zovas uh, are, uh, uh, Cheryl sang for the Metropolitan Opera Company. They are retired to Palm Harbor. They have established several foundations for the encouragement of opera, and they are very, very supportive uh, to Tarpon Springs. Uh, recent transplants, uh, Dee O'Brien and Graham Jones, uh, are, are very interested in Shakespeare and have done some wonderful productions. And, 
and reinterpretations of um, uh, Shakespeare at our Performing Arts Center. Tarpon Springs still continues to attract the visual artists. We have a large number of artists who work in our area. Um, I'll just quickly go through them. Uh, Elizabeth Indiana, so we spoke. Kevin Grass teaches uh, painting at St. Pete College, but he is a nationally known realist artist. Rocky Bridges um, is, uh, was born and raised in Tarpon, um, and he currently lives in Lakeland, but is one of the most important artists in Florida today. Robin Sanger, uh, who may also be known as a city commissioner, uh, but and, or operates a program called Peace for Tarpon, which is nationally recognized. Joseph Winesettle, a transplant, who is a plain name artist who tries to channel George Ennis. Um, Lynn Foskett Pearson, who is the president of the Tarpon Springs Art Association um, and is, uh, is becoming a very highly recognized artist. Um, and Lisa Marie Sibley, um, could be like our poet, our photographic uh, laureate, if you will. Two, um, uh, Tarpon still attracts nationally known artists. And um, uh, Robert Stackhouse and Carol Mickett uh, are actually internationally known artists who have moved and established their studio in Tarpon Springs. Uh, if you go to Creative Pinellas, there is a major exhibition of their work right now talking about climate change in terms of uh, water resources, and it's well worth uh, going down to see that. Bill Luxinger and Carol Schroben, uh, they are Midwestern artists, digital artists, very well known uh, in the Midwest, who have a winter residence uh, in Florida. So we have some very interesting artists. I just you bear with me, I have to also talk about that artists is always, or Tarpon Springs has always been a place that attracts very unique people. So we have a few artists who have gone rogue in Tarpon Springs. Uh, and uh, Ronald Locke, for example, was a nationally known uh, landscape um, a printmaker uh, back in the 40s. He had been all over the United States, great reputation. His work still sells for quite a bit of money. Um, but at the end of his life, uh, he knew he was dying, and so he came to Tarpon Springs, and um, uh, for the last two years he was here, he did um, uh, these prints along the Anclo River. Philip Sawyer was also another nationally known artist who, don't know what happened to him, but he had some kind of a breakdown, and he lost all of his money and everything. He moves to Tarpon Springs. He lives in a piano case along the Anclo River. He publicly says, I have no use for money. I don't want money. Friends of his would come and pick up paintings that he had and take them down to the sponge docks and sell them to tourists, way below what his value of his works were, uh, just so he'd have enough money for food. He lived there for about a year and a half before uh, he became really sick and, and died. Um, Petr uh, Janowski uh, is a Polish artist who came to the United States. For, I don't know why he moved to Tarpon Springs, but he was he was pretty well established artist at the time. He was known for doing these very conceptual kinds of works of art using tin foil or aluminum foil. He would wrap things. Uh, he wrapped uh, a series of trees in front of the uh, St. Pete Museum of Fine Arts, and he did some other major buildings. He wrapped his house in <laughs> aluminum foil up in Tarpon Springs. It caused a lot of controversy <laughs> and whatever, and uh, people weren't too happy, but it was a rental house. So, so it was a very interesting story. He now lives in Vienna, Austria, um, and um, moved uh, probably about three years ago. Warren Gregory is a real character. Um, you have to Google him. I can't tell you the whole story. It's pretty sordid. Uh, but um, he uh, started putting these bicycles all over Tarpon Springs. Became very well known with bicycles. Made national news. Uh, it was quite uh, a thing. But he got into a very confrontational relationship with the city of Tarpon and eventually um, uh, was kind of put into a position where he had to get the hell out of Dodge. So he moved to Amsterdam, uh, 
in Holland. He had most of the, of the bikes shipped to Amsterdam. And I just saw on the national, on, on, on the national news uh, uh, on CBS Sunday morning about his bicycles in Amsterdam and what a success they have been uh, to that city. But um, he's still in legal action with the city of Tarpon, so it's, a, it's quite a story. So we do have these artists who go rogue on us. Uh, lastly, we look at public art. Um, the city uh, now has a strong public art um, uh, commission that is doing some great work. Uh, but initially, the, really the first piece of public art was Mitch Colby's Epiphany Sponge Diver that's in front of the uh, Greek Orthodox Church in the plaza next to it uh, that was done in 1990, a bronze. Uh, this John Mazzolini, a group of uh, Greek um, uh, patrons purchased the sculpture, gave it to the city, and it has been installed at the sponge docks. Since the establishment of the uh, Public Art Committee, this uh, another uh, donor uh, gave to the city uh, this ama of Tarpon Springs by uh, a European artist, Amarellis Batilla. Um, and um, this is a part of an international chain. There are 16 of these uh, sculptures around the world. I don't know if this is still the case. At the time, this was the only one in North America. And I don't know if that's still true, but um, it's uh, down on Craig Park. Um, Glenna Goodacre, the Naiads, has been installed in a roundabout at the end of the sponge docks, uh, Dodecanese Boulevard. It's become very popular. People come and get their photograph taken down there. and. Um, uh, it ties to the Greek history of our heritage of Tarpon. Uh, lastly, um, w probably one of the first pieces of commercial art when the sponge docks was done, Ceramica Europa did some uh, uh, painted tiles that are kind of needing some restoration uh, that are by, by the sponge docks. Uh, the Garden Fairies, uh, an organization in northern Pinellas County, a group of artists, collaborative, uh, went together and they did this wonderful mural of Mother Mears. I think it's 16 feet high. It's on the side of the Mears building um, and has been reworked. Uh, uh, her, her expression changed, which is very interesting. Um, but it is a, a wonderful uh, piece to add to uh, Tarpon's uh, public art. Um, the uh, Cultural Center will, is just now reopening, and for it, because of public dollars, a uh, public art piece, so another Glenna uh, Goodacre story time, which can also show you the um, back of uh, the public library if you're viewing it from the other angle. And the most recent public art piece to be established um, is um, a series of 15 solar light boxes. So they had artists compete for their work. The work was selected. Um, uh, transparencies were made of that work. And then they're inserted into these light boxes. And then at night, they light up uh, from the solar panels that are uh, next to them. It's very effective. It's a very wonderful piece of public art uh, that has been added to the collection of public art in Tarpon. So I think that's about it. I want to thank the Tarpon Springs Area Historical Society. They've helped me a great deal in putting all of this together, uh, particularly Phyllis Colianis, who is a vice president but in charge of the archives there. And I encourage all of you to go up and see the Tarpon Springs Art Center, walk around and look at some of these buildings. It's a very walkable city, and many of the things we've looked at are within easy walking distance. So thank you very much.